at our MedTech panel and addressed many, many topics in the MedTech area in AM. And unfortunately, it was much too short because uh, beside the current situation, MedTech is one of the hottest topics in additive manufacturing. Um, this is why we are lucky because uh, the Fogel Communication Group uh, with its moderator, Mark Platthaus, will have a panel discussion dedicated to medical today. I will call Mark now. Mark, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Hi to the audience. Ah, I can hi hear everybody. you both. Uh, I can hear you all. Perfect. Mark, I see, I see you have uh, excellent participants on board. What can we expect today from the panel? I hope so. I, I think uh, I think we will we will discuss two uh, the two main topics. On the one hand, the technological side of uh, of additive manufacturing in the medtech industry, and on the other side, we will have the uh, the regulatory requirements, which we uh, which we discuss uh, in the in the second part of our discussion. Perfect. So I'm very happy, as I already said, because we couldn't touch all the topics yesterday. So I'm so happy that you are doing this today, especially the regulation part. Good luck with it. Uh, say hello to the other participants and enjoy your panel discussion. See you, Mark. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to our. So I think now I'm now I'm uh, now I'm at a go. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to our panel discussion: additive manufacturing in medtech challenges and regulatory requirements, which we are holding on the main stage at Formnext Connect. My name is Mark Plattaus. I'm the editor-in-chief of DeviceMate, a community magazine for the medtech industry, and your host for this discussion. First of all, I would like to introduce you to the participants who are sitting together with me on this digital stage. Uh, I will do that in alphabetical order. Dr. Stefan Boleininger is CEO and owner of Beyond Quality, a consulting firm that specializes in adv advising industrial clients in the medical technology sector, particularly on regulatory affairs aspects. Lea Eilert is technology and project manager at the ACAM Aachen Center for Additive Manufacturing. ACAM is the one-stop shop for additive manufacturing, covering the entire process chain from design stage through to quality control and focuses on topics such as process chain automation, the development of customized materials, increasing productivity, and reducing turnaround times. Gregor Reichler is head of additive manufacturing at TÜV Süd. Gregor is leading TÜV Süd global activities within this segment. He has 12 years of experience in the field of additive manufacturing and has audited, trained, and consulted more than 80 additive manufacturing production sites worldwide since 2008. And our last participant today is Professor Dr. Peter Pott. He is head of the Institute for Medical Device Technology at the University of Stuttgart. He is an expert for mechatronic systems and components in a medical technology context. But before we start our discussion, um, we want to do this uh, not as a closed discussion here uh, on, this, uh, on this digital stage. You can also join the discussion uh, by, uh, by uh, putting your, uh, uh, your questions in the question and answer uh, in the question and answer button. I will, I will have a look at this and um, I will uh, address them to our. Uh, to our participants. When you look at additive manufacturing in the medtech industry, you have two main topics. On the one side, you have the technolo technological advantages through the use of AM. On the other side, we have the regulatory requirements. And as I first mentioned, first we will start with the technological advantages. Gregor. Many experts say that medical technology is one of the sectors who have the greatest potential for additive manufacturing. Can you tell our audience why this is the case? 
so in my opinion, there are two uh, factors. One of them is that customization comes um, comes for free. So custom-made or patient-matched devices produced uh, via 3D printing technologies um, are very cost-efficiently produced. Um, so and this uh, custom-made or, or patient-matched devices are always uh, in the functionality better for the patient and better for the use of a particular dev device. So the quality is nearly in all cases, rather it's dental industry or implantology uh, improved. Um, devices are, are longer, staying longer in the in a, in a patient body and are more robust and um, and even the operation time is reduced because um, the the devices are uh, um, delivered with the exact fit um, already. So and this is uh, one one thing and the second thing is complexity. So complexity printed uh, was uh, like lattice structures which enable um, osseo integration where bone is growing into the implants and and other com complex features in the in the devices are only achievable through 3D printing technologies. And th these two factors combined um, really disrupt certain uh, products in the medical device field. Mm -hmm. uh, Leah, when you uh, Gregor mentioned the uh, the complexity of uh, mm -hmm. of uh, medical devices, um, can you give a little uh, uh, can you give a little hint in in your point of view what uh, what uh, com complexity mean in this uh, in this kind of topic? Yes, of course. Uh, thanks for the question. So um, if we have a look at, at, um, at the process chains in additive manufacturing, um, they're fundamentally different from um, when, when you talk about added value or generate added value uh, compared to uh, conventional manufacturing technologies. So uh, with conventional manufacturing technologies, um, speaking of complexity, um, the more complex your part is or is designed, um, especially with some designs uh, that can't be manufactured conventionally. Um, the more complex your part is, the longer it takes and the more, more uh, process steps it takes, um, uh, which increases the cost, obviously. Um, so it takes longer to manufacture that part. And uh, with additive, um, you actually start uh, generating value um, with designing or during the design step already. Um, and it is possible to uh, to print the part later on um, only from uh, the CAT model. So uh, the more complex the model is, um, it does not mean in additive um, in an additive aspect uh, perspective um, that it is it takes longer or that it's more uh, cost intensive to to manufacture the part. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Peter, when I look at your work, uh, you are uh, you are getting this uh, this kind of this additive manufacturing in more academic way. Uh, what is your uh, what is your opinion regarding regarding additive manufacturing, especially in the medtech industry? So what we know is, so what we agree on uh, certainly is that every patient is different. So if we have a technology that enables us to deliver a patient-specific therapy, um, we we can guess that this will lead to, to better outcome or shorter um, times to recover from surgery. However, what we need is, uh, is evidence. So um, in the past, even way before we had um, um, additive manufacturing, there were attempts to deliver patient-specific parts, implants, for example, on the hip. And it proved that um, the surgical outcome was not as good as expected. There were lots of problems while well, milling in those days, milling implants, um, and, and also the mechanical stability was not as high as expected. So I see, I certainly see a, a, a great market for patient-specific um, products made by additive manufacturing, but I, um, I'm quite careful to say that this is the solution for, for every or uh, lots of problems. We always have, have very concrete technical problems for uh, a while um, uh, looking at the geometry of a patient, for example, to design a specific implant before surgery. Because before surgery, we only have uh, imaging data in terms of CT or MRI data. And this does not always uh, match truly with the um, 
geometry of the bone which we see later on during surgery. So it can happen that we have a situation that we have a perfect implant, uh, printed, whatever, um, that does not really fit to the patient because of some flaws or just errors in Im imaging. So I, I do see, a, a, nowadays, I do see a big market for uh, tools, patient-specific patient tools, for example, for finding the, the right way through an organ, for example, during um, spine surgery, for example. Um, but then the actual screw or, or implant is a, is a mass product um, that has been tested and, and proven quality. Um, of course, there are some, some uh, uh, specific applications um, for, for individually printed parts. But um, I see a long way to the future to show that these, these are actually better than mass product produced parts. Better for the patient in the long run, not just next week. Should be should be better for the patient in 10 years still. Um, Stefan, do you want to add something to uh, to this uh, to this kind of thinking? Uh, yeah, the benefit on the technological part is from my for me as a regulatory, I'm very skeptical. Um, for everything of new technology because I'm an old-fashioned guy. So um, for, for me, it is, okay, I can be more precise on a specific patient. And that's the thing. For mass product devices like you have in the syringe market or something like that, it's not a, not a, a big deal. But if you go, perish, like Gregor said, very cool, it's patient-matched. If you go more patient-matched with the devices, then um, additive manufacturing is a real game-changer on that. So for that case, it's... There is, a, from my perspective, the real benefit. Uh, game changer sounds great. Uh, Gregor, uh, how can uh, medical technology companies use this potential of a game changer for th of 3D printing to drive product innovation? Um, there, it's multifaceted. So first of all, um, companies need to start think um, think uh, how to utilize the potentials. Uh, so it's uh, some companies call it additive thinking or gener generative design thinking. So to understand really how to uh, get the potential of of the technology into product designs, um, one one very important aspect to start. So just simple advice, place a small printer for the engineers and let them do for one year. Let them uh, experiment with the printer um, and try out uh, Phelan because it breaks already the, um, the first hurdle to start. And of course, it needs to be then, um, yeah, uh, maybe you can follow some pioneers in the industry. We have uh, excellent pioneers in the industry since 10 years. So if you look into dental field, if you look into uh, auto field, field and as well into hearing aid field and, uh, and spine cage and hip cup manufacturers, uh, we have a lot of um, pioneers in the med tech industry, which successfully have um, uh, products at the market since uh, many years. So you can follow those and build up on top your new ideas. There's enough room for everybody to come up with great product designs. Um, so the pioneers did the excellent work. Now the regulatory guys like uh, like uh, TÜV and and uh, uh, Mr. Bollinger, we are we are kind of defining um, efficient approval concept and as well um, we are writing on standards. So we are involved in standardization and AM to prepare standards which help the community to implement the, te the technology on a trustful basis. Trust is very important as the Bollinger mentioned for, for approvers. Um, otherwise, the approvers will uh, will lead to a to a big question mark. It's innovation. I can't approve it. So please do five years on validation on it, and th then there where the showstopper is. So so we need to follow the pioneers. We need to write standards all together and and develop trust in the community. So. Uh, Leah, I will come back. I will. Co I want to come back to the to the technological part of the uh, of the uh, uh, of the three D printing. You at ACAM work together with many industrial partners. What are the greatest hurdles for them to uh, to get used to to uh, additive manufacturing? Uh, 
Mm -hmm. So um, this really depends on whether you uh, start from scratch or whether you speak of companies uh, that want to start from scratch with additive manufacturing or that already implement implemented some structures into their uh, production, into their company uh, throughout all company levels. And um, what we see is um, most of the time, firstly, is a lack of knowledge uh, regarding the possibilities of the technology, but also the challenges that you have to face regarding that technology. So um, most of the time in media or in If you, if you read articles, uh, you see uh, pictures and, and descriptions of great uh, best practice examples. But um, those can be a little bit misleading if you are not familiar with the possibilities, with the technological and the technical possibilities. So uh, you really need to educate yourself and, and uh, get, get trained and get your staff qualified in this direction to uh, Yeah, to design and produce reliable parts. And this is a really, really important point. And um, I already, uh, I uh, sometimes um, talk to companies, talk to customers that, um, yeah, they told me um, we bought a printer uh, several months ago and we, we did a few trials here and there, but now it's really sitting in the corner collecting dust and we don't know what to do. Um, and this is uh, really not the way to go. So uh, please think first about um, your applications and really AM suitable applications, materials um, that you want to produce your applications with. And um, um, so application center and application driven design Um, and then start thinking about which system uh, to invest in. Because uh, usually, so if we talk about polymer processing systems, um, it's uh, compared to metal processing systems, um, more or less a little bit on a cheaper side, not much, but a little bit. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, especially with metal systems, it's a, uh, it's, uh, a really a capex intensive uh, uh, task to do. So um, educate yourself, get hands-on training, um, and then really, um, um, Yeah, think, try to think additively and um, get um, reach this mind shift, uh, not only um, with the technicians and designers, but also uh, throughout uh, all companies' uh, levels. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter Lea mentioned uh, metals or polymer components. Do you, uh, do you have knowledge of both and do you work with both or... Uh, or are you um, uh, are you addressing some uh, one or the other? Uh, Leah and, and Gregor both mentioned uh, additive thinking, and um, this is a very important uh, step, maybe maybe the most important step towards um, application of, of this technology. Um, You don't just interchange polymers with metal because of fun. You use both for specific reasons. And um, uh, one specific reason for using uh, metal printed parts is uh, uh, mechanical stability. And um, so for, for an implant, for example, where you have to, to transmit forces through the implant to the body or the other way around, you would rather use metal also because of Biocompatibility, biocompatibility reasons, uh, where you would um, rather use uh, polymers for for lesser parts or, or parts that that don't remain in the body. So we only we shouldn't only talk about implants. There's lots of other medical products. Um, in my opinion, it's important um, to uh, this to to implement additive thinking in a in a design process. You don't design a part for for a, for example milling, and then print it. That's the that's just the wrong way. You have to design it from the scratch for a specific um, 3D printing technology. So you have to know which technology is most suitable for this specific application. Maybe it's a powder based or a FDM based or whatever. Uh, a process and then design your parts uh, in a way that it can be easily printed and, and 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 also can transmit or bear the forces that are applied to it later on. So it's a big thing um, using um, simulation technology while while designing uh, your part because um, uh, the material behaves differently from from materials you have used in the past if you have lots of experience. Uh, and and so you have to get familiar with this technology in the first place. And then finally, if you know what you want to achieve for the patient, then you decide on which uh, production technology you, you would use, and then you design your part. It's it's basically the same as you did before, but it's a different manufacturing technology. 
And whether you use metal or not, it's just it's just not a question. It's a question of application uh, to decide on the um, on the material. Um, additive thinking is a is, is a great term. Uh, uh, Gregor, can you can you take us through the process to establish additive manufacturing in the medtech industry when a, when a company want to uh, want to address uh, their their needs with with the additive manufacturing process? Sure. So um, first of all, we need to differentiate, uh, like from comments from Leah and uh, Peter, um, is it their company which um, which is just at the very beginning? Then we need to generate and invest uh, a certain time to enable additive thinking. Um, and then we have a second group of, of uh, medtech um, experts, which has already developed that, but then they are in process to establish a production according to FDA or according to MDR. Um, and this is the second group of, of, of question marks which we will face. Yeah. Um, so I will focus now on the second group. Because um, yeah, here we are in the expert level and professional use of uh, industrial grade free printing. So here we have clear education schemes. Um, we offer a risk assessment for additively manufactured parts. We offer validation for uh, for additively manufactured processes. We offer quality management education for quality managers and quality assurance responsible people pe pe at the um, on the shop floors. So this free trainings are crucial for everybody on an expert level which would like to develop and production line according FDA or MDR. Then we have certification schemes according present additively manufactured standards. So we have standard for production lines, for materials, for designs in AM. And these standards has to be used via either training or you order an audit by by an independent notified body or a consultant who helps you to, to you know, implement those standards into your product design of, of the part and your process for the manufacturing part. So, and that's, we have a certain stage of state of the art implementation. They are standards at the market, which has to be used. We have the training schemes for it. And there's a consultancy available in case companies can't handle everything by them own. So Stefan, uh, I think your company uh, is is one of the auditors for uh, for this kind of topics. Can you add something to to Greg, what Greg mentioned? Uh, yes, but um, I would go first back to Peter's solution with the additive thinking because that is the main part. You when the, you can do commercial trainings, you can do come some kind of audits. That's all possible. But the main shift is between on the area of development. So you need your product goal, that will be my product. And then you go disruptive, like Peter said. You go back and say, okay, I have my technology and now I need to assess it. And now as I go with that technology, so you shift from, I want to develop a, a product so to, I need to develop the product and the process. That was in the earlier times of medical device industry. Hey, electronics is electronics, and um, if you it's, uh, if you have a, a part in uh, in a, a high quantity, then it's commercially and um, standardized produced. But the only other thing is that you need to go now with the process. So that's the main thing that you have. And if you are a medical device manufacturer at all, then it's no problem. But uh, if not, then you have to add Gregor's all kind of training schemes to en enable yourself to be a manufacturer for medical devices. In case you have done that, then you need to go on the process for transferring it to the um, 3D printing. And that is the most important step as that differentiates between the com standard normal producement and the, medical, the additive medical device manufacturing. And this process, that is training, as Gregor said, validation, as Leah said, with how to get, um, how to ensure that you have the correct industry grade. And then, yeah, you need somehow one and somehow to get the possibility to get all kind of topics controlled, like why you use this kind of polymer metal or whatever. And that is then the certification part where Gregor comes back into the game. 
So I think you get your the audience attention with uh, with your uh, with your answers because there are uh, there are two two questions from the audience um, and and one is focusing on training. So um, uh, maybe Leah can answer that. What kind of training should one go for uh, to get into a, a polymer based setup in in, uh, in uh, to uh, regarding um, uh, metal setup? Mm -hmm. So with uh, polymer additive manufacturing, it's uh, usually a little bit more accessible. So uh, the printers and then with the material, um, it's a little bit more accessible and um, a lot easier to uh, to operate. Um, so especially those little desktop printers where you can uh, quickly just print a model um, during its prototyping stage. So um, I would say if you start from scratch, uh, get get your basic training on polymer additive manufacturing technologies. Um, you can do uh, you can uh, book those at Acam, for example, or do those with uh, with TÜV. Um, and then um, if you um, get a little bit more familiar with the uh, uh, theoretic theoretical um, 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 basics, uh, get hands on training for the printer. Maybe buy a printer and then just um, uh, try it out. Um, and then uh, there are also uh, multiple possibilities uh, to get uh, certified uh, officially um, as an operator for uh, not only for metal systems, but also for uh, polymer systems. So um, if you start from scratch, um, just get basic knowledge. Um, and then um, if you are um, more advanced in this, uh, in this type of field, um, you can get um, officially certified, for example, with, uh, with a DVS um, uh, certification. Okay, uh, here comes a more uh, more general question. Um, how would you rate the uh, actual medical market exposure? How much additional AM market can be developed after hips, teeth, and knees? Uh, what do you think? Uh, are there are there any uh, any other kind of uh, kind of uh, products you're thinking of? Um, maybe Gregor and then uh, and then Peter fill something. I guess this this is Peter's question. I, I, I have my opinion, by, but I, I fully trust on his opinion. <laughs> uh, thanks very much. Um, um, I, I didn't get the question right. There was some flaws in this in the sound. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, I will. Uh, uh, something about hip, the knee, the teeth, and then just I missed the first part. Yeah. Uh, um, how, how would you rate the actual medical market exposure uh, for for additive manufacturing, uh, and how much additional AM market it can be developed after hips, teeth, and knees. As you mentioned, uh, you, you have to think about more than implants. I, I do think more than implants. And I see, I see um, actually, to be honest, I see only little market on hips and knees because this is something that's easily mass produced and is a very strong material needed uh, uh, to, to, to deliver uh, the, the functionality. I see, I see a, a big market, for example, for uh, orthosis, like outside the body, prostheses outside the body. Uh, all the interfaces between a, uh, a, a thing, a device that does something, and the actual patient. Because the patient is, is very specific. The device as such is, is yeah, it's always the same thing. But in between, you need some kind of interface. For example, to deliver heat or force or um, maybe even drugs for example um, it's like it's like eyeglasses ah, they they are mass produced and in the end they are customized and i see i see a strong a big market for this last mile or last thing of customization of a more or less mass produced product um, and of course this is this is a very it's a big issue for for um, for regulatory affairs because at this at these uh, interfaces you always have the problems with materials with surface quality with um, chemical uh, reactions or biological reactions between materials and the human um, and and um, I mean we are we are we have lots of issues with mass produced implants that actually or by theory should do what they do but they don't in in uh, in the patient and we will have the same issues with with individually product uh, produced uh, devices or or implants or whatever um, but it's even harder to 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 find find the the actual reasons for those problems 
So to answer the question, uh, where do I see the market? I see the market basically uh, at interface points between uh, the human and the product um, in that way of, of customization or, or patient-specific patient um, product. And we, we, will, we will wait long years, I see, I think, before we see the first uh, syringe uh, 3D printed, because that's an injection molding part. It's just, you can't, you, we will never cheaper than injection molding. Stefan, you will you want to add something? That is exactly my thinking. If you have injection molding in a high scale, it does not flee, fly with additive manufacturing. But um, it's um, Grigor told it is a very nice way. I noted it down. It's patient matched. If it's a patient match device, that is the perfect term to say, okay, then it is has a high value because then it's better adaptable and better adaptable to a patient means the healing process is faster and better. And that's a main area. So everything like Ortiz's, like Peter said, that is a reason where additive manufacturing is the best thing. And please, something which is always has been forgotten, Peter has also told it in some form one word, biocompatibility. This is the cru most crucial part we have from the regulatory this um, point because with the uh, HPLC um, topics, with uh, um, uh, with uh, testing, the chemical analysis, this is pretty hard for uh, injection molding and more hard for an additive manufacturing because then you have process change as well, which is not only the product. And that's something you never shall forget. Um, maybe... Can, can I add something to that? Sure, sure. Um, I have been involved in, in lots of research in the past um, for, for hip joints. And in a hip joint, depending on the actual technology, you sometimes have um, PE parts, polyethylene parts. Polyethylene is perfectly biocompatible. It's, it's actually a very it's a simple thing. However, um, we we see problems with particles. So um, a hip joint is a, is, a, is a very strong part and there's lots of forces on it. And, and these forces lead to the fact that tiny little particles of the PE, which is biocompatible, perfectly biocompatible, get, get loose and start drifting through the body. And they start inflammatory, inflammatory reactions somewhere else in the body. And so this is not a problem of manufacturing. This is not a problem of... Uh, of material as such, but it's a overall a general problem. We we see in this specific example of a wonderful matched implant, a perfect material, but still things happen. And if I think of, for example, powder-based 3D printed parts, I, I have really bad dreams about particles floating through the body because these particles are already there. They just stick together and it can easily, well, more easily get removed from each other then does a massive PE part. And so um, when I think of implants and 3D printing, I see lots of issues on the horizon in the long run. We, we say when we agree, and I do, that, that um, probably a, a patient-specific part will lead to a, a shorter um, a hosp hospital stay. But as a patient, I don't care whether I, I'm in hospital for five days or seven days, even 10 days, I see the long run and I want to use an implant for 10 years. And if I get a perfectly printed 3D uh, uh, implant and it lasts only three years and I have to go to hospital again and I was only five days instead of 10, then I don't care about those five days. As a patient, I'm interested in long run uh, performance of an implant and not in a, in a shorter hospital stay. A shorter hospital stay is only good for our healthcare system because it's cheaper. And that's what we have to keep in mind as engineers. We are thinking we should focus on the patient and, and deliver good quality for the patient um, in the long run. So, so thanks. Okay, I think I think <laughs> this quite a sums. <laughs> yeah, th great. Uh, this should be your end statement. Uh, uh, um, there you go. <laughs> I think. <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, now we can conclude with that our our technological outlook. 
uh, and come to um, some some of you touched uh, touched this part in 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 some of your answers um, the regulatory part and um, Gregor because there are so various topics regarding uh, regarding validation regarding auditing and so Gregor has a little presentation I think he will start uh, right now so so we can take that as a discussion. Uh, for for our next minutes uh, or so uh, when we discuss this kind perfect of thing. yes that's a, uh, so let's start with uh, with one two three slides and then we will discuss um, the to the major topics which are coming up now together with the MDR um, and um, and the interpretation of it um, so we see first of all that we have uh, two major um, regulatory um, pathways one is fda and another one is mdr mdr is a european uh, medical directive fda is a us uh, um, way of approved uh, medical products uh, both are installed um, or on the way to be installed the new update on the mdr are going to be valid from 2021 one on um, and here uh, the experts are discussing already since uh, let's say two years how to interpret it, interpret it in the right way, as as the the law is written in in the law language, not in an expert language. So um, here we come to the major point of it. Um, um, first of all, we need to understand. Um, what means if the MDR talks about custom-made devices? Custom-made devices, um, and as then especially produced by an um, industrial method, like 3D printing is in the most cases. And here this, the discussion starts already. Is the printer an industrial method? Some of, some of the people in the market will say, no, I just produce one part with it, um, and it's not industrial. And other, other uh, companies will say, of course, it's an industrial printer. I can produce hundreds of crowns or hearing aid dividers in one batch, and it's a batch production, and that's it's industrial. And so, so, and and the law says, the law, the MDR law says, if it's not industrial, you can take a regulatory path for patient um, 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 for patient match devices uh, or custom made devices, which is which is less, um, let's say, so quality assurance and approvable um, required uh, than on the on the um, industrial process. So that's why every industry is trying to take this path dental industries they are trying to over you know to take the shortcut yeah um, from my experience as a technician i have to say the discussion is is going in the right wrong direction we should not focus on what the law is trying to guide us we should focus on what the technology really needs and the pain point of the technology is the build process the printer itself the build process is a very early majority status to being used for production so we need to take care not to deliver parts which will harm the human body, whatever kind of parts these are, and especially if they are in the body. So our dental industry or implant industry or others, parts in the human body needs to be quality assured, needs to be quality management, and needs to have um, a full 100% quality controlled processes installed. Then the discussion ends quite fast without either it's patient matched or patient specific or custom made and how do we need to interpret this? Because this is focused on what the technology can deliver and what the how we can bring this value of the technology to the patient in the long run, like um, like Professor Port said, uh, we need to take care about the quality. So this would be my uh, interpretation of the of the all discussion of patient match, custom made, and how it needs to be interpreted. Let, please, let's just take care about quality assured build process in the printer and quality assured workflow. Now, the manufacturing process chain, um, then everybody going to uh, have really fun with the technology. So, uh, Stefan, I see uh, I see you nodding sometimes and then mm -hmm. shaking your head a little bit uh, after after Gregor's uh, Gregor's answer. What 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 can you what can you add to this uh, to this kind of topic? Yeah, shortly the, the right. uh, presentation. I don't know what um, our our auditorium just sees. I think they see the patient. Um, yeah. 
it's no, no, just... they, they, they see me. It's, it's okay. And okay. now they see <laughs> Stefan. <you> <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, it yeah, um, Gregor is uh, right on the few on a f many few parts, but on a few things I would change it differently. It sounded like a bit that as a manufacturers try to do to custom made devices to get rid of regulations. That's not the case. Um, the regulation made an open point to say, okay, we are here to not to harm you because, for example, when you go to your orthopedic and let brings the orthopedic in the way that he can manufactures your new shoe. Sets a custom made device. So you have a prescription, you have an, a, a doctor or physician who gives you that kind of prescription, you have the information about that, and that's the important thing. And yes, the so, sole so frame is pre assembled, pre manufactured, industrial way, and they make it in a way that it will be specifically matched for the patient. That's fine. And, and so they also have some kind of quality assurance, quality management system, according to MDD, MDR, does not matter. It's all had to do with it. In the past, it now even more. And um, that's, that's a thing. But on the other hand, he's fully right in, yeah, we shall not use custom-made devices to get find an excuse for everything. Because that's not the case why they built in that particular article in the law. So you need to be very careful and you need to decide. I am a regulatory guy. I read the law. I'm not a technology guy. Even I studied electrical engineering. I'm not a technology guy and would say, okay, let's face what is the law and what is most appropriate for this specific manufacturer and this specific product. Even if it can be produced in a very, for example, even with, this, with additive manufacturer or 3D printing, I can produce the device 200, 400 times batch after batch. So it's, that does not mean that this is a device which will be built afterwards is to be, um, is to be uh, um, not a custom made. It tells me, okay, I can reproduce it, which is process validation, it's pretty good. And so that's something um, we need to divide, divide very, very carefully. If that is device is needed to be custom made, then it's custom made. Then it's very easy and they will, have a very fast way. On the other hand, if it's a device which will be manufactured and it's not prescribed, then we should not do that. But that's responsibility. And that's what MDR wants. They want to take manufacture to the point of responsibility about what they do. And therefore, that's, yeah, you either do it right or you will lose. Yeah, just to, to add on this, I don't want to exclude Leah and Peter, but um, <laughs> you gave me a <laughs> so so uh, um, if we put the manufacturer in response to take care of the of the process, which is the right thing, yes, what the hardware manufacturers and what the material manufacturer needs to deliver to help the manufacturer to fulfill it, yeah, and this is uh, something what we should um, should take care of as an additive community, because our our uh, till now the hardware manufacturers are pushing this responsibility to the end user. The end user should validate and qualify the processes. But this is where the story then stops. And we have a showstopper because this usually takes something between three years and, and seven years, depends on the complexity. And that's why it's not scaling. So the, the hardware manufacturers, the material manufacturer need to take the law consider what has to be standardized and pre-certified for the use for the end users. So they just take care about the application specific um, validation, but not in the hardware and not on the material, not on the build process and, and maybe um, technology related post processes. This should come um, pre-qualified, uh, validated from the manufacturers. This will scale up the market. The, the users will have less time to, to get um, you know, uh, valid to validated processes because they buy in already pre-qualified equipment, and this uh, this will help everybody in the market, and it's a fantastic business model as well. Uh, so, Lea, uh, uh, do you want to add something in in terms of you at ACM are more into the uh, uh, technology side, but but you have to also focus on the regulation. Or? Yes, of course. So, um, for us, uh, especially um, 
Um, also for me personally, uh, I, I studied mechanical engineering with uh, with a focus on product development. So I'm not really quite familiar with uh, regulations, and and so uh, are my colleagues, I would say. And as um, as engineers with a production technology background, it is really crucial, especially in highly regulated sectors like the medical sectors, and but also the aerospace sector. So we have we see parallels here. Uh, it is really crucial to work in interdisciplinary teams um, so that every every uh, factor of of, um, of uh, yeah, related um, related points um, uh, can contribute uh, to a to a, to a project, and so uh, that we we uh, don't fail in the end with um, with our uh, yeah medical related project. Uh, and Peter, how important is uh, regu are regulatory issues for the for the academic research? For the academic research is nah. important at all. <laughs> <laughs> But we always focus focus on that. It's it's um, uh, of course if we do studies, for example, then we do have regulation in terms of ethics, for example. Um, but uh, from from a technology point of view, we don't care about regulation, to be honest. No, um, I see. From for me, additive manufacturing is actually just another method to produce a thing. It's like casting, injection molding, milling, whatever. It's just another method. And one of the interesting um, examples or in interesting features of this method is it's it's um, it's not subtractive. So I'm I'm not removing material from a from a from a part. I'm just adding material. So that makes it a bit more interesting for lightweight construction for specific construction but i can do i can do patient specific implants with a milling machine just the same way it's just another method of producing things so for me to be honest there's no difference in in customization whether i do it with an additive manufacturing method or any other uh, manufacturing method um, so so if we if we think of of regulatory affairs then then uh, it's it's like uh, stefan said It's from the patient point of view, if it's a specific thing done by, for example, a, an orthopedic uh, um, um, shop, then this is this is a patient-specific thing. If it comes from, from a company that produces those patient-specific things in batches, or even if they do a single part, then for me, this is, is an industry pro, um, production thing, just as is casting, injection molding, or, or milling, or whatever. Um, it's an interesting thing, of course, but it's it's not not special as such. Peter, I have to um, add something here on because yeah, yeah. if we just compare one to one, it's just another manufacturing method. Um, it it missing the entire potential of additive manufacturing technology. Mm -hmm. So so we are kind of not not thinking about the utilization of it and and what kind of new potential has milling. Yeah, no, no, from, a regulatory point, from a regulatory <laughs> point, you yeah. don't care about potential. You just could care about the thing. And you don't care yeah. about how it's done. You you, oh. you said so that quality management is a big thing for editor. Okay, I agree. Okay, regulatory But professor, from yes. A, from a yes. patient point of view, from a regulatory point of view, I don't care how this computer mouse has been done, has been made. Yes. Someone could have bitten yes. it by speed. Yes, as as soon as soon it fulfills state of the art. So if you yes. if you look from the regulatory uh, auditor, which comes into the to audit a new device, uh, yes. he will he will ask for for evidence. He will ask of state of the art processes, and if the technology is so early ma early majority uh, that this was not used for this particular device before, the dilemma starts. The, yeah. The, well, the, yeah. As an, as an auditor, as an auditor, I'm asking you, okay, you, you made this computer mouse. It's great. It does its job. Are you able to produce 10,000 of those at the same quality with yeah. your method? And if you say, yes, I can, um, and you can prove that, then it's okay. If you say, no, that's just a good one I showed to you, and other ones are not that good, then uh, I won't certify you. <laughs> exactly. But it's, exactly. But it's the same, yeah. it's the same if, you, if you took an old-fashioned milling machine to produce this yeah. computer mouse. If you're not able to produce 10,000 mice in the same way, um, you have a problem. And that's quality management, as you said. Yeah. But it's not an issue yeah. of additive manufacturing. Yeah. 
I, I would like to um, share maybe one more slide with you guys, because if we talk about quality management on additive manufacturing, and this is an important aspect as we all agreed, um, I would like to show you the, um, the present status or uh, what, what we see as, as additive manufacturing um, quality. I'll just skip over the, the MDR uh, regulative slides. And we uh, here, here you see, by the way, um, the present uh, additive manufacturing standardization activities. It's ISO TC261 is the home of additive standardization. And very, a lot of useful standards are generated here. Peter, by the way, if you look at the, at the joint group uh, 70. They I can't take... read it. It's so small. Oh, <laughs> damn it. OK, so I, I will talk it verbally. So the joint group uh, 70 under the umbrella TC261 is taking care about image data. One of the problems, what you, what you said at the beginning of the discussion, mm -hmm. they standardize how to scan right for medical devices. So to avoid the errors which are coming with a scan and are translated into a, de a design file. So this group is taking care of it. So we, will, uh, we, we are expecting within the next two, three years, a standard based on it. If the standard exists, we are implementing the technology on state-of-the-art level because there is something on evidence where international experts worked on. A second and third example, which I would like to for the medical industry, is the Joint Group 72. They take care about IQ, OQ, PQ uh, standardization for the manufacturing process. And the Joint Group 75, which I am uh, leading, uh, they take care about quality assured production um, with an additive manufacturing. So, uh, so and these um, three standards, which are coming up within the next uh, year, partly as a draft, and the next upcoming years, then as a, a really standard um, will will be somehow um, a game chamber to the industry because we can rely on them if somebody implements a technology on the on the standard basis the auditors can can ask for it they they they, they we can develop trust for the technology um, so so this is on quality aspects on the standardization if you look at the quality answer from from the market the iso 13485 in the medical industry um, is a valid answer for quality management reasons yeah it's well known standard in the industry um, the, the only issue with the ISO 13485 is that it is not technology specific. And AM is so early in the market that nobody has a clear answer how to validate the processes. So that's why we, uh, there's a new a normative document out there. It's a Dean Spec 17071. It's publicly available everybody for free at the Boyd. You can download it and, and implement your production based on this um, normative documents. This, um, this normative document will be changed next year to the ISO ASDM document, which is going to be the 52920. Um, and this defines how to implement quality assured manufacturing lines uh, for additive manufacturing. So this is how the, the present status of, of quality management standards and state of the art is already. So we are not talking about R&D. We, we are able to implement on state of the art basis. And that's, uh, this just changed recently within the last one year. Thank you, Craig. Um, sorry, I want to go back to one of the uh, one of the questions from the audience. And uh, Stefan, I think you should be the perfect person to answer that uh, because because it's it's uh, touching our topic. Um, how does the notified body assesses the criticality of the three D printing process with regard to process validation? Um, so um, I hope I had the quote right. It was um, it was quoted by Leonardo da Vinci. Count what is countable, measure what is measurable, and what's not measurable, make measurable. That's the thing. You need to you need to go for it and say, okay, if you need a process validation, yes, for milling, the same as for um, for additive manufacturing, same. You need to, as Peter said, reproduce your mice in a large scale. You need to have the same mice in the same scale in a very big scale. That's validation to make it reproducible and sure that it will be reproducible and not making it a point by point 
verification. So yeah, pro, for additive manufacturing, same as for um, uh, injection molding, you need to have a validation on that kind of process, same as gluing or um, soldering. And in that cases, you validate it by creating a scale. So that's a one thing, and that's um, so the main changes that you have with a, in normal with injection molding, you have a batch of products. You can validate them with the IQ installation qualification. That's, that's, um, that's something which is so so fancy, like in the time of my grandmother. Then um, you have the operational qualifications. That's the same thing. Performance qualification you can do with injection molding by measure piece by piece by piece. You can do all of them and measure them and say, okay, fine, qualified, all good, validated, everything's perfect. So you have measurable criteria. It's the same you have with additive manufacturing. However, then you have one problem. You do only in many cases you only do one patient specific part, and then eh, validation fails because you cannot validate with one piece. And then you need to make a setup for that setup to validate it. You create a dummy device or with the same qualification, with the same idea about and uh, the same uh, performance you want to achieve. And then you take the process with that product with that different product and you validate the process. You validate the process chain by creation and by um, extraction and measuring of one specific or with more specific, with more samples, but with a dummy device, which has the same criticality and um, criteria and, and some kind of qualification. And then it's fine. And then nobody can claim you against that it's not fulfilling all your specifications. If you do that, you're fine with validation. And in case your auditor does not accept that, call me, I will make him accept. <laughs> <laughs> you have an advocate. <laughs> you touched, uh, you touched uh, uh, a very different, uh, a very, di uh, a very important topic because there's another question. Um, inter interesting point about pre-qualified equipment from suppliers to help the manufacturers validate their processes faster. However, mm -hmm. I think this guy comes from the US. However, for US marketing in particular, it is not clear what the qualification certification needs to be. Uh, do you have any advices, uh, Gregor or Stefan? Yeah. Uh, okay, I take it. Uh, so, so if you if you look um, at the activities at the Joint Group seventy two from um, from TC two six one, they they take care about um, validation of powder bit fusion systems. So if you talk about the powder bit fusion technology, they're going to be a standard end of the next year available. Um, so you can take over this um, into your hardware descriptions into your hardware uh, calibration program. So you sell the hardware already with a calibrated processes according the standards. And your users, um, the future users of the standards needs just maybe uh, one month to, to do the um, facility-based add-on work, but they don't need to spend uh, one till, till three years to validate the system. And this is a huge difference and huge enabler and leverager for, for the implementation of uh, industrial AM. Um, secondly, you can of course talk to us, to suit. So we certify the build process as reproducible. We have a new certification scheme for reproducible AM build processes. So we certify the material and the parameters used in a particular printer to, pro to produce a particular material property. So we as a third party can give you a proof of trust with a certification on your build process um, and you can sell it to your customers certified, including all documentation and validation work. So he as well has less work to do with the validation of the entire system. And I'm sure the auditors will be happy to, to hear that there was a third party involved into the process validation. It's a, it's a great answer to, your, to, the, uh, to the auditor um, from the user side. So Stefan, short, short answer because time yeah. flies okay. uh, from your, uh, from your is, side. Sorry, Gregor, I do not share the opinion of pre-certification because if I build a if I use a pre-certified device, place it in my garden, then the device gets wet and the validation's gone. The manufacturer who places the device on the market, US, Europe, no, it, it does not matter which, has the obligation to validate his process. And that is the one. The pre-certification is nice for marketing. 
but it's for the real manufacturer. I, I know plenty of auditors who tell me, yeah, it's pre-certified. We had the same with software, with um, pre-certified software systems. Does not work out actually because the auditor said, yeah, but you have used it in a bit of different context, in a bit of different material. Yeah, you changed your production location. If you go for that, for example, yes, that's called notified bodies, team NB, collected that as a significant change, creating a new production plant. And therefore, oh, we have no problem. We need to revalidate. So we start again, start again, start again. The valid pre-certification void at exactly that moment, you deliver it outside of the company. You can do many of things, I agree, you can do many of things prior and give the, uh, support to the manufacturer, but the manufacturer has obligation and the duty to fulfill the law and to do it right, and most manufacturers luckily do it right. I, I, I fully so agree. I, the responsibility so I, is at the manufacturer. I want to stop the discussion. But Sorry, guys. You, you, if you, you just, just need you two should... months, then, then <laughs> three years, it's great for the industry, and that's it. Yeah. You, <laughs> you should go on that topic one-to-one, -to -one, I think, because uh, we only have uh, two minutes and 30 seconds left and I want to give you uh, to give all of you uh, the chance to to answer my final question what do you think uh, uh, what will be the importance for additive manufacturing in the next year for the medical technology uh, I think I will will it will it go up will it go down or will it be the same uh, Lea I will start with you yeah so um Regarding the, the AM technology, so we saw this uh, during the last few months um, during the COVID crisis. And um, uh, yeah, really ad additive manufacturing had its moment there. Um, but then we also saw that it was quite um, quite hard to, to produce a, such a high amount of um, protective equipment that was needed, especially for hospitals or for uh, medical practices. So this is something that we experienced in the last few months. And I think in the next year, um, when uh, economics are uh, starting uh, again, I hope, and in increasing, um, additive manufacturing um, will, uh, of course, continue uh, to be a very important uh, manufacturing technology, especially in the medical field. Um, and um, what I experienced also in the last few months, um, companies still rely on additive manufacturing. And this is what we also see at Form Next year. Uh, a lot of people from many different fields, many different sectors, not only the medical sector, uh, sector are uh, still um, interested in the technology, are engaging with each other and are exchanging experiences and um, and thoughts on this. And so, um, especially for, for the medical sector, this will uh, continue to be a really important and really um, exciting manufacturing technology, especially um, as this is... Um, so if we have a look at, at implants, so this is what we talked uh, a little bit in the last few minutes um, or in the last uh, few, uh, in the last hour. So additive uh, or men, um, implants are not better even um, only because they are uh, manufactured additively. Um, the uh, added value here lies in the customization and, and in the integration of, of functions and um, integration and combination of certain parts. So, um, and for this additive manufacturing works like a charm. So this will always be a really important uh, manufacturing technology here. Peter, uh Quick thoughts from your side. Uh, to two the seconds kind. left. <laughs> yeah, two seconds. No, no, I think we have 30, 30 seconds left. Um, <laughs> from my side, um, I think there's there's a huge market out there for uh, for additive manufacturing, for this patient-specific uh, um, applications. And that's what I said before. Uh, we have to keep in mind a patient outcome. Um, and uh, I, I guess it's it's just on the rising uh, rising side of the scale. So so we will go up with additive manufacturing um, in medical technology in the future. To keep it thank short. you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. And thank you very much for this lively discussion. And you see, uh, one hour doesn't doesn't uh, touch all the points. I have a lot of questions left, uh, <laughs> which will not be asked. But um, I think uh, it, it will be a start and we will discuss this further on. Uh, and thank you very much, Peter, Stefan and Gregor and Lea. Uh, and uh, hopefully see you next year at Formnext in presence. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you, Bye. Mark. Thank you all. Bye -bye.